Welcome to Speaking of Higher Ed, Conversations on Teaching and Learning. I'm your host, Andrew Everett. This podcast is produced by the Center for Instructional Innovation at Augusta University. We release new episodes the third Wednesday of each month in spring and fall semesters. Please take a moment to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. This is episode 12. Our guest today is... Hi, I'm Peter Berryman. Thanks for being here, Peter. Peter is the Director of Digital Instruction for the Office of Teaching and Learning Excellence at the University System of Georgia. Good job. <laughs> so that our listeners can get to know a little about you, if you'll briefly share the professional path that led you to your current role. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, I started in this position roughly two and a half years ago. I um, was hired to design and implement a training platform for the University System of Georgia faculty and staff. Uh, prior to that, I spent 10 years at uh, Georgia Southern University as an instructional designer. Uh, I learned a great deal uh, at, at Georgia Southern, uh, just in the process of building and designing courses and assisting faculty with that process. But I also had prior experience teaching online and in classrooms and designing my own courses. Uh, I have a background in teaching art and design at a number of art, art schools around the country, as well as at Georgia Southern as well. Well, we're glad you're here with your wealth of knowledge, and we'll get to it later. I'll ask a question later, but... Uh taking some of your courses and really like what you do. Yeah, well, that's good so to hear. I'll ask more about that later, but let's get into the topic for today, which is professional development training. In this case, we're talking about the Moment Momentum U platform. Right. So what is Momentum U and who is it for? Right. So Momentum U is an online platform hosted by the University System of Georgia in the Office of Teaching and Learning Excellence. We use Brightspace, which most everyone is familiar with, as the learning management system, but it's provisioned with a set of courses, resources, and even live events. Uh, for example, we once hosted uh, the 2022 Teaching and Learning Conference, but all of these resources are provisioned to assist faculty in preparation for their teaching practices to support student success. Um, it originated back during the time when we went all went off campus because of COVID. And, you know, the system discovered that not all universities, colleges, schools were prepared to support the faculty and students equally. And so the idea was to create the central uh, a resource for everybody to participate, to engage each other, and to utilize those resources for whatever those needs may be at that time and place. So the original vision came out of the COVID, early days of COVID? It it did. It came it came out because the recognition that we just weren't prepared mm. to support all faculty at all institutions and all of the students. And of course, we have larger institutions. We have the research institutions, the comprehensive institutions, we have the smaller state uh, schools. Uh, and everybody has different levels of support from staff and personnel who can support the faculty and students. And so we sort of wanted to find a place where we there was a place where anybody could come and depending upon what their needs were for professional development and for learning about best practices for teaching and improving student success, this was the central location that, that they could come to. And all USG faculty, full-time faculty are enrolled, and we can enroll upon request part-time faculty and USG staff. Okay, so this was a large undertaking that you had to do pretty fast. How long did it take to come to fruition? Well, it was huge, and they hired one person. And you know, to be honest, they really weren't sure what it looked like in the beginning. So there was a lot of trial and error and discussion about what that looked like. I mean, how do you serve 26 institutions? How do you serve um, over 20,000 faculty and their different needs and interests in terms of professional development and academic support? Uh, and then within the Brightspace learning environment for asynchronous, self-paced types of instruction content where no facilitator is present to uh, facilitate and provide guidance with the content. So 
it, it was it was a difficult undertaking. We went through a lot of drafts as to what types of content we should provide and what it should look like. And ultimately, it's matured to the point where I think it's really on the brink of becoming something very successful and supportive of, of all of USG. Well, that leads us into my next question, which is, as we head into 2024, what is new with Momentum U? Yeah, so first, you know, actually, I'm going to go back and tell you what we started with. Okay. Uh, we started with a set of courses that were based on the research by the Chancellor's Learning Scholars from 2020 through 2021, I believe, on a set of pedagogies that were proven to improve student success rates. These included... Uh, strategies such as uh, transparency in learning and teaching, or TILT, or small teaching practices by James Lang, or growth mindset. Uh, and so the first courses and content that we built were based upon those uh, specific areas. Uh, the idea at first, too, was then to have faculty complete those courses, and then to, through some process, evaluate their impact upon students at the institutions. How did teaching uh, transparency in teaching and learning compare to growth mindset, compare to small teaching practices? And so this was the initial focus. And so we completed that first set of courses within 18 months. And they went through a series of iterations and design and redesign and edits and all that. After that point, we began looking for new types of content to support the faculty. Uh, those have included uh, uh, a lot of content for online instruction and development, uh, sets of tools to promote active learning in classrooms, a course borrowed from uh, Affordable Learning Georgia to promote uh, open educational resources. So we're continually looking at where we can appropriate content. Generally, we look for the experts within the system to provide that content. And then I come in as the instructional designer to create a learning experience and design a course around that content. So when you identify the content that you want to add, what is the, can you go a little more in depth in the process to um, sure, absolutely. the course together? Yeah. So first we identify the expert and we go through a conversation about what the goals for that course would be. We have to be very clear and specific about the goals because we understand that faculty have very limited amount of time to spend on optional voluntary course work. Uh, so value must be built into the course. And to that end, we make sure that our the goals uh, are very specific and that if you engage in the content of the course, you walk away with something valuable that you can use. So brevity and shortness and value are, are must be built into the course. And that begins with a conversation with the subject matter expert. We kind of go through a back and forth process where they produce a first draft. I put the course, the content, and the learning management system. I check it for continuity, for holes and gaps in the instruction. I look for how we can build uh, engagement and learning activities into the course, even when it's self-paced, asynchronous online instruction, when no facilitator is present with the learner and there may not other be may not be other colleagues present as well. So there must be motivation for them to continue. And that led to a process of building and using a scaffolded instructional process where it allows the learner to only go as far as they want to go into the course content and to complete the activities up front if they're uh, studying a new topic. Uh, there is a module of information which just at the end, it, it tests them on their ability to understand or remember the information. And they can walk away with a badge uh, for the time they have invested in the course. If they want to go deeper into it, there is sort of a teaching lab opportunity uh, where they can apply and practice that strategy in the classroom and then report and reflect upon the effectiveness of that strategy, and they earn additional badges. And at the end, if you complete all the activities, there is a certificate. We also have a, a document library. So if somebody is just perusing the course, they can just go to the document library and find something there that might help them. And also the courses, uh, you can self-enroll and self-unenroll. So we try to give as much autonomy and power to the learner with motivation embedded uh, to continue, but only go as far as they really care to. So can you share with us a 
a preview of some of the topics that are currently available on the platform. Yeah, so the, the big one right now is elements of high impact practices because the high impact practices are it's a it's a trendy word now on all of our campuses because they have pro it, it's proven and researched that students who engage in these practices uh, end up succeeding and continuing through the four years of their education and they're well prepared for employment afterwards. So we have the elements of high impact practices and then we have courses specific to the practices such as service learning, work-based learning, and also undergraduate research. There are some other courses that we could create, but these were the first three that sort of rose to the top that the institutions and people on the campuses felt that they would like to see first developed. And you've got, I know, um, in addition, the quality, some quality matters sure. as well. So definitely, uh, you know, this is online instruction. We're delivering an online yeah. product. So, and, and I'm, you know, in that practice, I'm sort of emulating what online courses look like, and I want to provide some background and information as to what quality online instruction looks like, even without the presence of an instructor. So Quality Matters uh, is a, an organization that publishes a rubric of quality course design standards for online courses. And we don't promote it specifically because so many of those practices, although they're embedded in the Quality Matters rubric, many faculty are already using them. Them. So we sort of kind of use them gently uh, and we build them into the coaching of all of the ways uh, and, and guidance that we provide for building courses. But we do have a specific course on the Quality Matters rubric that if you are interested in looking at the rubric and designing a course in accordance with those rubric standards or evaluating your course design based on those rubric standards, it's a really easy course to go through and complete. I have a background with Quality Matters. I've facilitated over 30 uh, workshops face-to-face -face in, in the classroom at Georgia Southern and then also online for Quality Matters. And I saw the the Flagstone Quality Matters course is applying the Quality Matters rubric, and it's very comprehensive. The scope is a little bit more than I think a lot of faculty want. So in building this specific QM course, I focused on just the rubric, just what do we need to know about the rubric standards to help us to create quality online instruction? So, and also there's a, a course template that is built off the rubric that could be utilized uh, to help you build out the course in accordance with those standards. Now, you don't, your institution doesn't have to be a Quality Matters member to take that course or use that rubric. QM gave me uh, permission to use their resources to build this course, I think based upon our prior working relationship with them. And I, I do want to highlight the course template because uh, I've, I've gone through that. It's you've, the way you've done it. So you kind of learn about it as you go through. And then at the end, you can yes. download the, the Brightspace package. And that's really, right. really um, a great resource. Right. So I have to give credit. So that, that template started a long time ago, 10, 15 years ago with my predecessor at Georgia Southern University, Raleigh Way. And a lot of people within USG know of Raleigh and he passed it on to me. And I made a number of upgrades and changes. And over the years, the challenge has always been how much to give to the course developer, to the faculty to use as a resource. If you give them too much, they become overwhelmed by the amount of, do I have to use all this content? If you give them too little, maybe they're not quite sure how to use it. So, you know, there's a balance and just, here's an example of what a quality, a, a unit of instruction looks like based upon the Quality Matters standards. And then using that unit as an example, and then the rubric, you know, the template is there. It has pages that are built out in advance with some coaching and guidance to help them build out the instructional modules to whatever degree that they desire. And they don't have to use all the content. They can pick and choose. They can copy and paste from here to there. It's all meant to give them as much autonomy over the use of the product as, as possible. Well, it's well done. And uh, and I like it how clean and simple uh, to use 
uh, yeah. that you, you've got it. Yeah. So how are some of our USG institutions integrating Momentum U into their professional development offerings? It's kind of all over the map, which is good because every institution perceives it differently and, ha and you know, has a different use for it. Uh, the, the smaller schools, uh, which aren't well-staffed, uh, like the opportunity to, if faculty come into the, a teaching center. And that teaching center, there may only be a part-time faculty member serving as the director. And that person really doesn't have the resources to provide them information about small teaching or tilt or uh, elements of high impact practices or accessibility. And so they can direct that faculty to the, to the course to the platform and to the courses, and they can utilize them. The faculty can self-enroll and utilize them as they wish. Other institutions have actually adopted some of the courses as part of their uh, their, their programs. Uh, teaching centers have employed the courses as part of their faculty development programs and directed them to take this course. And in some cases, they don't have to complete all the content within the course, but to a specific point. Other course, other institutions, Augusta University, for example, we provided them with their own instances of the courses that could be facilitated by experts on their campus to create a more engaged cohort of learners. That's something that um, we can do as well. And in fact, because of that, we're now moving towards uh, a method for being able to actually distribute the course packages to the institution so that any institution can import and use those courses within their learning management system to be facilitated by their people and to track the development of faculty on their on their campuses and to support those faculty. And again, at the end of the day, this is all about supporting student success because those are just everybody. We're all working towards that goal. So if, if an institution listening wants to customize some of that content, they, uh, they reach out to you? How do they get started? Yeah, exactly. So the first thing is to reach out to me through my email address, which is peter.berryman at usg.edu. Uh, and just uh, request that they have interest in receiving those course packages. But probably first, they would want to familiarize themselves with, well, what content is available that they would like to use. The address for that content, if I can recall, is usgtrain.view.usg.edu. By logging into that page, you are then prompted to log into Momentum University. Full-time faculty are self-enrolled, and that process should unfold seamlessly. It's a two-step authentication process, just like you use on your campus. Uh, but if you get an error that you're not admitted, um, there's a, a help button to request enrollment, and I take care of that pretty quickly. And then, then it's just a process of going through the, the platform and reviewing the courses. Uh, there, there, all the courses have descriptions, an outline of the content, uh, testimonials, the types of awards uh, that can be earned, as well as the course goals and the kinds of things you can walk away with before you even enroll in the course. So it should give you a good idea. And you know, if you're just interested in everything, let me know. You can download them, try them out, and, uh, and, and see what you like. I should mention at this point, this is a new process and program, I've only got three courses prepared for distribution at the moment in this manner. Uh, and that is TILT, uh, Small Teaching Retrieval Practice, and Growth Mindset Course Design. So those are immediately available. And the others will, will follow shortly, hopefully before the new year. Okay, great. So aside from short courses, uh, what other resources can faculty expect to find some specific resources yeah. um, on Momentum U? So, you know, courses, they take time. And, and we design the courses to be completed as, as quickly as maybe two or three hours. Some have classroom activities. And depending upon how those activities are scheduled, the time to complete may be a month or two. But we also want to provide, you know, resources, toolboxes, toolkits for quick intervention interventions within the classroom. A really good one that we adopted recently from the University of Georgia uh, 
was their active learning toolbox. There's a set of uh, approximately 30 active learning strategies with examples and, and directions for implementing those strategies that if today, if you're just wondering, what can I do in my classroom tomorrow or next week to engage students, uh, there's a host of resources right there that, that you can just download, you can print, and you can use and refer to to develop an activity in your classroom. So we hope to continue to build on those types of resources that are not a course which takes time and there's uh, you, you know, all sorts of activities built in, but just here, here's a piece of paper, here's a template, here's a document that gives you quick instruction and classroom interventions to improve the classroom experience for students. So Momentum U is not just a place for, for courses that you go when you have a chunk of time. It's also a place when you need some uh, kind of just-in-time help. Indeed. Uh, also, you know, other resources, we have the research published by, for example, the Chancellor's Learning Scholars or uh, research about uh, from uh, re redesigning uh, case studies for redesigning courses. We have archives for the USG teaching and learning conferences with those presentations embedded in both video and the, the documentation provided. So, and we also hope to at some point, build out communities, learning communities, communities of learners, where faculty, educators from different institutions can gather at one time and place to talk about what's happening within their departments on their campuses so we can share and exchange information rather than being so siloed and self-contained and, and uh, you know, not, not so much aware of what everyone else is doing. What about accessibility? What tips or advice could you share with faculty who are interested in learning more about accessibility? Yeah. So first of all, accessibility is the law. It's something that we must attend to. And often, you know, maybe we don't engage uh, students with disabilities in our classrooms that often, especially if you're teaching online, you may not know. Uh, often we get letters of accommodation requests and so aware of those, but a lot of students also prefer to kind of struggle through on their own as well. The thing about accessibility is that it's pretty easy to accomplish. Once you understand the basic rules of what makes content accessible, first, it makes it access more accessible to everyone, you know, and and also, you know, just in the way that content is presented on a page in a logical manner, visually, to assist people using screen readers, those same features embedded within the software to make that content accessible for screen readers also helps to make that content more digestible and understandable to people who have sight. And so it, it really is quite easy once you get into just the, the how-tos and, and why it's important. Uh, we don't presently have a course on web, web accessibility. That course should be shortcoming uh, within the next few months. We did have a course at Georgia Southern. I'm just working on porting it over to the environment. Um, I myself uh, was disabled temporarily for two years. I became uh, temporarily uh, blind uh, until I had the corrective surgeries. And during that time, I could only see eight inches in front of my face. And I could, I could read a computer screen, which is as far as my interaction with the world could go. But I really started to understand and appreciate the value of attending to uh, the principles of accessibility because they help to make my life easier. And again, it actually helps to improve the quality of your instruction because everything can become more clear and more usable and more accessible to the diversity of all learners. Absolutely. Well, we look forward to, to that course uh, coming to Momentum U soon. It's a good one once we get it done. So having taken some of your courses, like I mentioned earlier before, um, the way you present content is is simple, it's easy to read to, and to follow along with too. So could you share your course design philosophy? Give us some, some nuggets on course design. Sure. So I, I may have been hired for this position on one statement that I believe in doing more with less. 
Okay, so let's maximize. Let's look at the basic tools and let's make the most of them that we can rather than introducing a lot of complex technologies and, and you know, this technology, bring that in and this one. And all technology requires different sets of instructions and users adapting to the technology. So my goal was first to make the technology, the learning management system, as simple and as intuitive to use as possible. And I'm not a big fan of the default Brightspace interface. And because I have some control over the settings within the Brightspace environment, I was able to use something called the new content experience, which streamlines the way content is presented within the course. Uh, so that was to my benefit. But, but also, you know, I wanted faculty educators, when they looked at the courses, I wanted it to feel like it, they were reading a book, that the text was well presented on the page. They were able to focus on the content. You know, there's a lot about a research about line length, how long a line is, the, the amount of space between the lines, uh, the use of headings, all of which contribute to our ability to read effectively, efficiently, and to comprehend uh, what we're reading as well. And so I paid a lot of attention to just how information is designed, the user experience, how they move through the course, how they use the tools, how they use the quiz tool, the discussion tools. These are frustrating for many faculty and students. It tends to get a little messy and complicated in that space. So a lot of effort was put into customizing that space. My background as a graphic designer, web designer, and user experience designer gave me that advantage to sort of anticipate what might work best. And I learned a lot of lessons. At first, uh, after the first go round, I realized yeah, I've overcomplicated this. I made some mistakes, you know, but that's in anything we do. The first iteration is sort of, you know, it's a little rough, uh, but now I'm very happy. I think the content has matured to the point where I'm, I'm quite proud of it. And sometimes I, I don't know how to improve it, but there's feedback. And so that opportunity is there at the end of every course to receive feedback from the learners. And that feedback is applied. There was one faculty member who, as I'm working, I'm receiving the feedback. I can tell they're working in the course. I'm making the changes while they are using the course content. I kind of got a kick out of that. <laughs> <laughs> so people um, who maybe don't have some of the, the skill sets and the background that you have, they can still take advantage of some of this by using the course template. Right? Well, yeah, the course template is, is built uh, to accommodate simplicity. You know, in instructions should be very clear and efficient and to the point, especially online, because online learners can be distract. In the classroom, you have a captive audience to some degree, Okay, you can tell who's paying attention and who's not. But when a learner is at home, you don't know who's ringing their doorbell or the dog is barking or just whatever is going on. So, you know, the, the template is designed in, to help people focus on what they need to do, when they need to do it, how they need to do it, why they need to do it, which helps with motivation. And with that clear instruction, you know, we hope to minimize uh, the distraction, minimize the need to reach out to the instructor, ask questions. Well, how, I didn't understand how to do this because the instruction wasn't clear or wasn't presented in the right time and place. I mentioned, you know, we use syllabi and we put all the instructions in the syllabi about the courses. Student asks, asks a question, it's in the syllabus. But the syllabus is not at the time and the place in the course where the student wants that information. If it's in the syllabus, you're diverting the student's attention back to the syllabus to locate that information and then to come back to the content of the activity and then to juggle this is what it said. This is what I'm trying to do. But if we put that information in the content at the time and the place they want it, then they can learn more effectively and efficiently. So that's kind of what the template tries to coach uh, course developers to do. 
Wonderful. Well, let's take a quick break. We'll come back and wrap up and ask the continuing the conversation question. Great. The Open Paws Food Pantry provides food and toiletry items for any currently enrolled Augusta University student who visits one of the two pantry locations. Please consider donating needed items such as non-perishable food and drink, hygiene products, and school supplies. Donations may be dropped off at either location, on the Somerville campus in Bellevue Hall and on the Health Sciences campus on the second floor of the Student Center. Both locations are open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. If you know a student who may need assistance, they can find more information by visiting augusta.edu and search for open pause or by stopping by one of the pantry locations. As we wrap up, I want to ask our continuing the conversation question, which is how does someone interested in Momentum U get started? So the first thing to do is to locate our uh, sign-in page on the internet, which is usgtrain.view.usg.edu. And that will bring you to an instance of D2L's uh, Brightspace with a login page. And there's a Momentum U login button. Select that button, walk through the two-step authentication process, you will then come to the USG Training Initiatives homepage where there's a banner for Momentum U. Select the banner, and now you are fully engaged in Momentum U, and you can browse the catalog and the resources. Uh, there's pages for learning more about Momentum U, its history, its background, uh, the authors, the, the catalog of all courses, uh, and self-enroll or unenroll if you didn't want to take that course. So that's the starting point. Uh, and if for some reason there's trouble with that login process at usgtrain.view.usg.edu, there is also a link to send a support request to me, which I'm generally able to respond to and get you enrolled properly, probably between six and 12 hours. And so for people who have already enrolled but haven't looked lately, they need to come back and, and, and see what you've added. How, how often are you adding new content, would you say? Is there... Yeah, so probably we're adding content, uh, a new course every two months uh, is probably the, the rate at which we're working. We do spotlight courses right now, the small teaching retrieval practice was spotlighted because in the middle of the semester, and it was spotlighted a few weeks ago, if you need to make a change that day, the small teaching course uh, provides some examples for interventions during a lecture to help students improve how well they understood and remember that lecture. If you just want to redo an assignment, if you have an assignment where students are not progressing well, uh, the TILT course walks you through the steps for improving the transparency of assignments so students may be more able to understand how and why this assignment matters to them. And when they have that clarity, they may be more motivated to apply themselves to the expectations. So that's something somebody could do over the winter break if they just want to make a quick adjustment to a course. So we need to bookmark the website once we sign up. And right. come back often and see right. what's new. All yeah, right. please do. Perfect. Well, thanks again for being here, Peter. We appreciate you talking about Momentum U. It's a great opportunity for USG faculty and staff. Great. It's so nice to be here. And thank you very much. I Absolutely. appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. I also want to thank our listeners. Please take a moment to rate, review, subscribe, and share. Speaking of higher ed, we release new episodes the third Wednesday of each month in spring and fall semesters. You can find the resources we discussed today on our show page at augusta.edu forward slash innovation. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash A-U-G-C-I-I. -I. You can also email us at cii at augusta.edu. Speaking of Higher Ed is produced by the Center for Instructional Innovation at Augusta University.